All right, let's have a down-to-earth discussion about self-defense. Uh, first off, if you have questions about unarmed self-defense, you might want to ask experts in that field. There are plenty of channels on YouTube, you know, like Hard to Hurt, Ramsey Dewey, etc. It's not my specialty, although when I was younger, I practiced KC Fighting Method, which is a self-defense system developed based on real-life street fighting experience. And uh, I also read a lot about the experiences of street fighters like Mark McYoung, for example. Either way, people sometimes ask me questions like, what would you recommend for home defense? Or what should I carry for self-defense? Things like that. If you have to ask which knife to pick to carry for self-defense, don't. People have a tendency to overestimate themselves. Uh, there's plenty of research on the topic uh, about all kinds of things, really. Drivers tend to overestimate their driving skill and underestimate uh, distractions. And people often overestimate how much they know, the Dunning-Kruger effect. The less you know, the less you realize how much there is and thereby how little you actually know. So there are too many people who buy some gimmicky self-defense marketing bullshit and carry it around, you know, be it a Coubertin or whatever. I'm, I'm pretty sure whatever I mention, it's going to offend someone who buys into it and thinks it's a great self-defense tool. I mean, a lot of things are better than nothing, sure. But the problem that I see is a lot of the time people buy something and carry it around and then they think they're going to be safe. If you buy a self-defense tool, which could be anything, by the way, it could be some keychain gimmick, it could be a uh, knuckle duster, a, an extendable baton, a knife, a handgun, whatever, really. And you carry it around, feeling safe, just for carrying it. But you never practice with it, it's not really going to do you that much good. Uh, especially if you don't think about the ramifications of actually using it. If you ask me for knife recommendations for self-defense, I can only tell you don't. Because if you had thought it through and had done some practice and whatever, you would already know what to pick. And if not, then are you really ready to use a knife against another human being? Do you even think you're able to accurately judge when it's time to draw it? Because don't forget, as soon as you draw a knife, you've just escalated the entire situation to potentially lethal. And there's no going back. I mean, if you are already threatened with your life, then yes. But sometimes it's not even that easy to tell, because guess what? If somebody already is rushing you with a knife and is trying to stab you, it's too late to draw yours. It's, you've already missed the opportunity. Basically, you have to see what's coming. You have to be prepared in advance. And that's difficult to do. And you can't just jump to the conclusion that, wait, the, the guy's rummaging in his pocket. I better stab him now before he can draw whatever he might have. That's, I mean, some people may argue for that to be safe, but that's not exactly an ethical thing to do, in my opinion. Just escalating from zero to 100 immediately has definite ramifications, legal, most certainly, and moral as well. You know, if you end up stabbing somebody who was not actually threatening, he wasn't actually armed, yeah, how would you feel about that? Especially if the person that you shanked ends up dying. Are you ready? I've seen a lot of tough guys in the comments, like, yeah, I don't give a shit. If someone attacks me, I'm gonna kill them. Um, most cases, no, I don't buy it. Most people are not actually like that. You might tell yourself that, but chances are you're not going to actually be like that. In fact, some people just straight up freeze when they're in a situation like that and they're being threatened. You know these lone wolf fantasies where the action hero scythes through hordes of bad guys without batting an eye? Reality isn't like that. Most soldiers who return from service where they saw combat and actually had to take lives are scarred by that. And this is not something to take lightly. But regardless, if we're just talking you're and willing to do whatever it takes to protect yourself, chances are you might be overestimating how tough you are. You know, particularly if you're young. You know, the younger you are, the more severe that is. I remember when I was a teenager, I had this typical 
feeling of invincibility. I thought nothing would ever happen to me, you know, even accidents. No, I'm, I just have good luck and I just, stuff like that doesn't happen to me. It happens to others. You know, until I had my first accident that changed my perspective quite a bit and until my body started to break down here and there and joints started aching and I started to get injured more and more. It puts things into perspective. You, you learn a little bit more about yourself. And so as a teenager, I had these ideas of if I read up on this technique and, you know, try it a couple of times and think about it, I'll be able to use it. <laughs> yeah, um, no, that, that's not how it goes. In order to really learn something, like to the point where your body learns it, it's one thing to understand it in your head. That's the first step. And it's not always an easy step. But then you have to practice it and have to repeat it over and over and over again until your body has learned it and then you might be able to do it under pressure because that's a very different story and then there are other mental gymnastics like okay yeah i haven't been practicing every day for two to four hours for five years or ten years self-defense techniques but um you know a real life situation is different because the adrenaline is pumping, so you're faster and stronger than you normally are. One of the things I really liked about KC Fighting Method was the way you got your first rank. They didn't actually test your form, you know, you didn't do a bunch of katas or whatever. It was a bunch of other students surround you with focus mitts and just keep pounding you and you have to defend yourself for... I forgot how long, but it was several minutes which felt like an eternity. And that was such a valuable lesson. Because here's the thing, yeah, yes, if, if you suddenly get attacked from, from all sides and have to respond, at first the adrenaline kicks in and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. 30 seconds later, you crash. Adrenaline is kind of borrowed energy in a way. Like you get this rush, but yet then you have to pay off the debt. And then, you know, it, it falls off pretty hard afterwards. And you have to be aware of that and be able to deal with it. And here's the other important part of that. Under stress, things fall apart. Complex things, forget about it. Unless you've drilled them over and over and over again, many, many hundreds of hours, you're probably not gonna be able to do very complex multi-step things. Which is why one of the best takeaways from KFM was the basic way to defend yourself, which is not unique to it. I've seen it in other uh, systems as well, which is basically you cover, you cover your head because a lot of people go for the head. You need to protect your face. You need to be able to see, you, you know, if you get knocked out, it's over basically. So uh, the idea is you, you do what you can to protect your head. It's basically like you know, in boxing, the defense against the hook, except that you do it on both sides and you look through your arms, you know, either like this or like this. While this is a protective shell, you also have spikes sticking out, basically. So, what I like about this is that's it, that it's a a simple panic button response, basically. It's not complicated. You know, somebody attacks you from wherever, boom, protecting yourself while attacking at the same time. Just as an example, what you really need is simple stuff, unless you have the time to invest into more complex things. Let alone if you do basically like a full-time job, then yeah, you're gonna do pretty, you're gonna be pretty damn good. This is why it bothers me when people say stuff like, oh, MMA fighters wouldn't actually be that good on the street because there are no rules on the street. Okay, they've been practicing, you know, biomechanically efficient striking, kicking, grappling, distance management, timing, etc., for years. What have you done? How much have you practiced in that time? Or have you just been sitting on the couch munching Doritos? Speaking of which, physical fitness is another big deal. And uh, this is where I have to point fingers at myself. I'm a mess right now. I am very much embarrassingly out of shape. And even though I'm, I've been working to get back on track, it's a slow and painful process with many setbacks. And how many people have COVID bellies right now? How many haven't been able to get to the gym in a while? Etc. And this is, you cannot overstate how important this is, especially, you know, cardiovascular fitness, you know, endurance is incredibly important in a fight.
Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make anyone feel helpless with all this. There are things you can do to prepare yourself for the possibility of an assault. Things, there are useful self-defense tools. And personally, I'm actually in favor of legal firearm carry for self-defense with some regulation to prevent irresponsible idiots from doing that. You know, mandatory training and licensing. Weapons are a force multiplier and thereby an equalizer after all. They can make up for physical differences that might leave you more vulnerable against a bigger, stronger attacker. But you need to know what you're doing. You need to be aware of the risks that come with the benefits. You need to be able to use it effectively. You need to be able to respond to a situation accurately. And for those people who can't or don't want to dedicate all that time and effort into preparing for something that most likely never happens to them, hopefully, I would frankly suggest getting a dog. You know, either for home defense, because it's basically an alarm system as well, and for protection on the street. And again, a trained dog, ideally. In my opinion, most of the time, the thing that does most to keep you safe is situational awareness. Because the best way to win a fight is to not be there. You know, if you see a threat coming and you can evade it, that's the best solution. Or, you know, and this applies to a lot of guys, if you keep your ego in check, and don't, don't go around starting shit. And if somebody starts the posturing, don't provoke them, because don't forget that a lot of times aggression comes from a place of insecurity. So if you poke that insecurity, it might blow up and lead to some nasty situations. So oftentimes you're better off swallowing your pride, letting it go, and you know just going on without being you know, a hot-headed ibex bashing horns with everyone who looks at you funny. That's not really a good way to go about life. If you're visibly attentive, you know, not glued to your phone, but actually looking around, being aware of your surroundings, you're not, you don't look like an easy target. There are a lot of things to consider. Basically, my main point is don't take it lightly, but also don't freak out and stress out over nothing. You know, if you're not in a particularly crime-ridden area, chances are you're going to be fine. Because most violence that happens in a lot of places, at least in Canada, is uh, gang-related. And if you're not in a gang, you don't have anything to do with it. So you also don't really have to be that paranoid. Anyway, let that be all. Thanks for listening. Hope you found it interesting. And uh, have a good one, folks. Mm -hmm.